Uh, our plan is to finish up 2 Samuel. Obviously, we uh, ran out of time a little bit because of the, uh, the fire alarm and that type of thing. Um, but that's all right. So let's go back to uh, 2 Samuel uh, 22. And then my plan is to talk about some Davidic Psalms. So we see that the history of 2 Samuel basically ends... Um, that David is kicked off the throne by his own son. His son dies a death of God, uh, God's curse by hanging in a tree, by being pierced. That David's heart is uh, out of whack. He's having inappropriate uh, reactions to these things. We see that David uh, commits treachery against people who he showed loving kindness to before, like Mephibosheth. Um, and so David is in this period of decline. There's another revolt, Sheba's revolt, in chapter 20, where the people are not loyal to David anymore, um, where they, he's basically able to say, who is David? We don't need him. Let's all go to, everybody go to your own home, own tent, and everybody for themselves. And so David's kingdom is not united. And so the history of uh, 2 Samuel ends uh, but it reminds us in a, an appendix or an epilogue um, of a few things about David's kingdom and the need for uh, the future. And so we looked at, um, in 21, okay, we see that the king needs to be a couple things. And one of the things in 21 is we, need, we see that the king needs to be a law bringer. He needs to be a law executor. Okay, this is in 2 Samuel 21. That there's a group of people who are still from the house of Saul uh, who need to experience the uh, responsibility and the consequences for uh, basically Saul's, uh, Saul's house. Okay? And so this shows that people can die on behalf of their, their group. Okay? So David hangs them up. Also, this connects with... Um, Deuteronomy 17, that the king is supposed to write a copy of God's law in the presence of the priest and have that there by his side so that the king is supposed to be in tune with God's law. And that's what we see with, uh, with Jesus, that he, qu he quotes Deuteronomy quite a bit because he knows, as the king, he is uh, responsible for the, the law of God. Okay? So we see this in 21. In Psalm 22, we see... Um, David's psalm, okay? See David's psalm, uh, which is paralleled uh, to Psalm 18. This is very similar to Psalm 18, where he says, God is my rock, my deliverer, okay? And then we see in uh, 2 Samuel 23, we see David's last words or his last song in 23. Okay, And so David talks about what the king and kingdom is. Listen to uh, 2 Samuel 23. He tells us, now these are the last words of David. So you could think about like there are famous last words that people say. Okay, What is the last thing that David wants to, to communicate. Okay, Look at verse 1. It says, David, the son of Jesse, declares, the man who was raised on high declares, the anointed, which is the word for Messiah, of God, the, the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel, the spirit of Yahweh spoke by me. Okay, So he says he's speaking the word of God by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men rules righteously. Who rules in the fear of God is as the uh, light of the morning when the sun rises, as a morning without clouds, when the tender grass uh, springs out of the earth uh, through the sunshine and the rain. Okay, so he says, when, if you have a really righteous king, this is a beautiful and amazing thing that can cause the earth to be restored. Okay, this is referred to in uh, Psalm 45, 
and also a psalm written by Solomon, Psalm 72, where uh, Solomon, in Psalm 45, the king, God says to the king, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Okay, so God is calling the king, O God, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, in Psalm 45, verses 5 and 6. Um, Psalm 72 that Solomon writes about the, that the, if a king righteously reigns, then God changes the whole earth through him, and that eventually God will have a righteous king whose reign will go across the whole earth and his, uh, his kingdom will have no end. It will be like the sun and the moon continually going in their course. Right? So David says if you really do have... Um, the righteous king to rule on the throne, God uses that to change the world in terms of the Davidic covenant. But then he says in verse 5, uh, this is not my house. Okay, so in verse 5 he says, truly is not my house so with God. The, the New American Standard, I don't think, gets it really right here. I think actually the best translation of this is in uh, the King James Version. Old King James Version. Does anybody have King James? No? Can somebody look up uh, King James real quick and read uh, 22 verse 5? Second Samuel 22 verse 5? Yes, please. In King James. Um, just make sure that's the right reference. Yeah. 22 verse 5. Yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry, 23.5. I said the wrong thing. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made me with everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure for this, all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. Okay. So he says, uh, basically in the King James, it says, my house is not so <clears throat> with God. Okay, this is in uh, 23 5 uh, and the King James Version. So sometimes the King James Version brings out a nuance that helps us understand it a little bit better. And I think this is one of those cases where David says, This is what you really need is this righteous king to rule. And God can use that and the Davidic covenant to change the world and to bring about the kingdom of God. But then David says, what, 22.5? What's he basically saying about himself? Um, basically, David says, you need the perfect king and yeah. I'm what? No. I'm not. It's not me. Uh, that it's not my house. It's not me. Uh, and so he says, it's not so with me. And so, but he says, his hope is, not in himself, but in the covenant that God has given him. In 22.5, he says, For he has made an everlasting covenant with me, uh, ordered all things and secured for all my salvation and I, all my desire, will he not indeed make it grow. Meaning God will produce this. God will uh, bring about the right king. But David knows that it's not him. Okay. So David ends his words with hope for the righteous king, the hope in God's kingdom, but he knows that, it's, that he's not the one uh, to fulfill it. So he looks ahead to Christ. Um, and this, so he goes on and uh, talks about uh, this in his, his last words. But then we also get in 23 a list of David's mighty men. So we see that David needs help. Right, that he's not able to bring it about for himself. God has to work through him. Uh, God has to bring this about. And David often needs, uh, needs help. He doesn't have the strength uh, to bring it all together. Okay. So in 24, we see David's sins. We see the, uh, the need for the king to be priest-like. Okay, this is in 2 Samuel 24. Okay, David fails in doing this because he takes a census. Okay, a census is counting up people. So because more people have been born, more people will die. 
And the census was for, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the census, the counting of the people, one of the purposes of it was not just to count up military men, not just to count up armies, but to count up, okay, how many people are they? Okay, these people need to pay for the upkeep of the tabernacle. Okay, the upkeep of the tabernacle. And so David counts up the people, and he's supposed to be the law bringer, but he doesn't have uh, sit, count up the people for the purpose of saying, okay, guys, it's time to pay for the, the upkeep of the tabernacle, God's system of worship. Okay? So there is a uh, punishment, there's a pestilence that comes onto the land because of David's sin. So we see this concept that the sin of the king, well, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, put it over here. Okay, the king can affect uh, the people, the nation, and the nation can affect the king in terms of sin and judgment. Okay, so the king... Can, uh, if a king sins, that affects everybody. If leadership sins, that brings down everybody. If the people sin, that can bring down the king. Okay? So David says at this point, um, while there's a plague happening, says, then David spoke to the Lord in 2417. David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking down the people and said, behold, it is I who have sinned. And it is I who have done wrong, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and my father's house. So David says, look, I'm the one who deserves it. Don't be against these sheep. He calls the people sheep, okay? Which means David is supposed to be what? If the people are sheep, David is the king, is the shepherd, okay? Now David deserves it. He says, this should be against me. But then when Jesus comes in John 10, he says, I am the what? The good shepherd. shepherd. And he says... I lay down my life for my sheep. Okay, so David is saying here, hey, look, don't let the sheep suffer for my sins. But Jesus, as the good shepherd, says uh, that he will lay down his life for the sins of his people, for the sins of his sheep. Uh, so there's this connection between the king and his people and sin. And so David, um, at the end here, he builds an altar. So he buys uh, land, builds an altar, and makes a place for sacrifice. And later, this will be the ground for the temple. Okay, David is not going to build the temple, but he's going to kind of lay the groundwork of here's where the temple is going to be. The temple is also on uh, Mount Moriah, which is in Genesis 22. What was the mountain in Genesis 22? What happened on that mountain? Guys, is remember? Is that where he got that uh, commandments? No, this is back with Abraham. Where you, oh, was that? Uh, this is... This is where Isaac, yes, is sacrificed. Abraham's faith is tested here, right? So it also becomes the temple, uh, the temple mount. Okay. Now David is starting to act like, in a, in the right way, starting to act like a priest. Okay? He's not able to be a priest in the sense of a Levitical priest because he's of the tribe of Judah. These different restrictions, and the king's not allowed to take those responsibilities. He's not allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. He's not able to do this stuff. But David says, okay, but in order to do my job, I kind of have to act like a priest in a different way. So we start to see this idea of priest and king being merged together in a different way than the priests of the uh, Old Covenant system. Okay, so what we see here is David uh, is laying the groundwork for the temple, uh, acting as a priest, Okay, and we'll see this also in uh, Psalm 110, that God says that uh, the Messiah is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek in Genesis 14, which was a king priest that Abraham recognized as a, a superior. Okay, so 
here's what we've got. Now the conclusion of 2 Samuel is uh, this idea is you need a temple. And so the idea is this. It's that God must come down. There's a need for God to come and a place for uh, atonement, sacrifice for sin, and God's presence to come and be. And so Solomon will build the temple. But we'll also see that no man can fulfill the Davidic covenant. And so you need God himself to come and fulfill it. And that's what we'll see in uh, 1 Kings and following. But also another place that indicates this is Isaiah uh, 9, 6, and 7 talks about Unto us a child will be born, he'll sit on the throne of his father David and rule, there will be no end to the increase of his government, but he will not only be uh, the uh, Davidic son, but it says he will be called mighty God, father of eternity, prince of peace. Okay, so that the Messiah uh, will also be Emmanuel, which will be God with us, that there's this idea that the, the king must ultimately, God must ultimately come himself. Uh, to, to accomplish this. Okay? Um, so that's the end of 2 Samuel. But I want us to take the opportunity here to look at some Davidic uh, Psalms. So let's go ahead and flip ahead in the Bible to the book of Psalms. And we're not going to fully get into this, uh, this book yet. But I want us to note some Davidic uh, Psalms here. Um, 2, 8, 16, 22, 110. We could also add Psalm 61, uh, Psalm 23, Psalm 24, Psalm 45, Psalm 102, uh, Psalm 72. There's, there's lots of psalms that point to the Messiah. You could write a paper on this. You could write a book on just the Messiah in psalms, and people have. Um, but what we see in the psalms is theology and poetry or theology in beauty. That the Bible does not just present, it's not a theology textbook about God. It doesn't just start with God, man, sin, and just give us a, a, a list of things that we need to know. It tells the story of God's kingdom, but it also, in a book like Psalms, takes God's truth and presents it in a way that makes us think about it, in a way that helps us appreciate the beauty of God's truth. Okay? Um, and, and what are Psalms? You guys know what psalms are? Yeah. Songs. They're songs. Yeah, they are, they are songs of worship uh, or reflection to be sung for different um, occasions. Okay, so it's a long book. Uh, it begins with how blessed is the man who does not uh, engage in sin, does not participate in sin, but he's, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and it ends in Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Okay. Um, so a lot of uh, great stuff in here. We'll get into Psalms later. But one of the connections you need to know is there's this uh, connection, this organization of the book of Psalms, which took over a thousand years to write. Written Psalm 90 is written by Moses. Uh, Psalms like Psalm 119 is probably written by someone like Ezra, who's toward the end of the Old Testament. So the Psalms are written basically from beginning to end of the Old Testament. Um, and what we see is this connection in the Psalms between the law of God, the word of God, and God's Messiah or King. Okay? So we see this in Psalm 1 that talks about that uh, the blessed man or woman is the one who meditates on God's law day and night. Okay? But then Psalm 2 talks about God says he's, he's given his king to rule over the nations. Okay? And he's given him all the nations as his possession. Okay, so that's Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. We see the word of God and the, the king that God has, uh, has appointed. Okay? We also see Psalm 19, which is about the word of God, um, in the sense that it's uh, Psalm 19 talk begins, the, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and it says we know God through knowing his world, but there's a more specific and even important way in which we know God, and that's through his word. And Psalm 19.7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect. That's where God actually speaks and tells us things. 
And so then after that, you have Psalms 20 through 24, where Psalm 22 is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 23 is, David says, The Lord is my shepherd, uh, that he's the good shepherd, right? And, uh, and then in Psalm 24, it talks about uh, the king of glory who is able to enter into heaven uh, before God, okay? And so uh, then Psalm 118 talks about uh, the Davidic, King as and the Messiah saying uh, that the that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is quoted um, like six times during the last week of Jesus's life, and it also is the psalm from which we get blessed it is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus during the last week of his life will quote Psalm 118. He'll sing it the night uh, before he's crucified with the disciples. Um, Psalm 118, Jesus will be arguing with the Pharisees. He's saying, you're the ones who are going to reject uh, the stone who God is going to judge. He says, have you never read that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? Meaning that you're going to reject me, but I'm going to be the foundation stone of God's kingdom, God's temple. Okay? And then Psalm 119 is the longest psalm about God's word right? Uh, that has... Uh, 176 verses in it, all talking about, it's a prayer about what God's word is and a desire to be more in conformity with God's, uh, God's word and his law. So let's talk about Psalm 2, okay, which is probably connected with Psalm 1. One thing before we jump into Psalm 2 is what you have to know about Psalm 2 is that this is one of the favorite psalms of the apostles. Peter uses it to preach about Jesus. The early church uses it in Acts 4 to interpret what's going on with, with Jesus' victory over the grave and the people being against God uh, and, and against his Christ. Um, Paul uses it in Acts 13. Okay? Another psalm that they use constantly. This has been called uh, God's favorite Bible verse is Psalm 110.1, which talks about the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Okay? Um, but Psalm 2 uh, comes up a lot. So does Psalm 16. It talks about the resurrection of the Messiah. Okay? Um, so Psalm 2, uh, can somebody read us uh, verses 1 and 2? Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2. Uh, yeah, Sophia. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying. Okay, so and it pauses there because it says what they're going to say. But it says that the, the nations are in an uproar against God. They're in a fury against God. They, they plan, they devise, they counsel together against God. Um, what are called vain things, which means foolish ideas, plans, devices against God. But it says that they plan these things against Yahweh and against his what? His anointed. Okay. What you need to know is this word anointed uh, is Messiah. Uh, it's against his Messiah. The, the New Testament word for this is Christ. Okay. So when we hear Christ, it's talking about Jesus the Messiah. Okay. Uh, Messiah, there are other quote-unquote messiahs, meaning someone who is anointed by God for a certain purpose, like Saul, like David. But all those plans ultimately come to rest on this one messiah who is God's appointed king over the, the earth, over all the uh, nations. Okay? And God calls him my king, meaning the king that God has established. Listen to... Um, Psalm 2, 6, and, and I'll read following. It says, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Okay, it says that God laughs at them for, for thinking that they can plan these things against God. Then now listen to Psalm 2, 7 and see if this sounds familiar. It says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. What does that kind of sound like? John 3.16, only begotten son. John 3.16 is writing with an awareness of Psalm 2. That that's, uh, talks about Jesus is the only begotten son, which means Jesus. John is proving that Jesus is uh, the eternal son of God by nature, but also he is the son of God in the sense that the Davidic kings 
were adopted as God's what? They're his sons, yeah. And so he's a king. He, Jesus is a son of God in a couple sense. He's the son of God because he shares the same nature and identity with God. He is God. He's the son of God also in the sense that he was, is born into the world. But he's also the son of God in the sense that, uh, that he's the Davidic son. He's the true king. And so he says to the Davidic king, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Uh, where else do we hear that language in the, the lifetime of, uh, of Jesus? This is my beloved son. This is my begotten son. Anywhere else? An event or, or two in Jesus' life where this comes up? Is there a point where God speaks in the Gospels and says of Jesus, this is my beloved son, this is my begotten son? Sophia? Uh, wasn't it when Jesus got baptized? When he gets baptized, yep. We see every member of the Trinity there. The Father speaks from heaven. Jesus is baptized, called God's only son, and uh, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. John witnesses that. And then also at his, uh, yeah, Macy. Um, not exact. Well, there was a time before where he's transfigured and he shows his uh, glory, and they get a revelation of what's going to happen okay. in the future. Um, but but yeah, God calls him his son. That's that's uh, prior to the uh, the crucifixion. So yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, that's that's what I was thinking um, as well. Okay, so John is is. Um, writing with an awareness, when he writes John 3.16, he's writing with an awareness of uh, Psalm 2. That this is who he is saying that Jesus is. Now notice what he says that, uh, what David says that God will give to his Messiah. This never was true of David. Uh, it says in verse 8, this is the Messiah speaking, uh, or God speaking to his Messiah, saying, Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possession. Okay, so what does uh, God give to His Messiah, who is appointed King over the world? Ask of me, and I will give you the. You guys can look. It's in verse eight. Ask of me, and I will surely give you the. You said so the nations as your inheritance. The nations. Yep. So He says. You're the ruler of the world. I'm going to give you the nations. I'm going to give you the Gentiles. They're, you're going to rule over them, whether they like it or not. But there is this opportunity for them to turn and to worship him. And, to, and it also talks about this word, ends of the earth. That comes up in the Psalms a lot. Comes up with the Davidic kings a lot. That eventually they're not just going to rule in Jerusalem and, uh, and uh, Israel. But they're going to rule to the ends of the earth. Okay, now think about what Jesus says in Acts 1.8, before he ascends into heaven, he says, you will be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but in Judea, Samaria, even to the what? Ends of the earth. He's saying, Jesus is saying, now that I'm king, I've accomplished the kingdom of God. I've died, saved my people from their sins, come back, resurrected from victory. He's going to go sit down at God's right hand. Like it talks about in Psalm 110, and he's going to rule there, and then he's going to come back and rule on the earth. Um, but he says, now the evidence that Jesus is the true Messiah is he's, his kingdom rule is going to extend through the whole rest of the earth, that the Gentiles are going to turn to God through him. Okay, So we see that even uh, today. Um, is anybody in here Jewish? No, I don't think so. If you're a Gentile and you believe in Jesus, okay, then that's evidence that Jesus rules over all the nations, right? For 2,000 years, there's something that has happened that has never happened before, and that's that the Gentile nations started turning to the God of Israel through Jesus Christ, right? So he says, I'll give you the nations as an inheritance. This can also be negative in judgment, but positive in salvation, and so let me just finish up uh, here, and then we will uh, quit class here. But it says, he says, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earth and wear. This is a, a judgment of those who will not submit to Christ. It says, now therefore, O kings, uh, show discernment. 
take warning, O judges of the earth. So God says to the leadership of the earth who does not obey him, it's time to wise up because my king is in charge. And now listen to what they say to do to the Messiah. What God commands uh, us to do to this king. Okay, listen to Psalm 2, uh, 11. It says, worship Yahweh with reverence uh, and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the son or worship the son that he not become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. Okay, so it tells us that we are to uh, worship, bow down before God's king. Okay, now let me kind of just sum this up. John 3.16, Psalm 2.12 is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only son. Gave his only son. You were my son, today I have begotten you. That whoever believes, believes in him, okay, takes, whoever takes refuge in him, will not what? Perish. perish. Psalm 2, that he become angry and you not perish in the way, uh, but have everlasting life. Psalm 1, uh, 6, which is connected, uh, talks about that, uh, that the way of the wicked will perish, but the one who is, is, uh, follows the Lord will have that uh, eternal life. Okay? So, uh, John 3.16 is basically established by uh, Psalm, an understanding of Psalm 2. Okay? But that Jesus is not just like another Davidic king who's a man, he is the, the God-man. That's what John is showing. And that as the God-man, he's able to fulfill uh, what no other king can do. Okay. Next time, hopefully, we will go over tomorrow and Friday the questions on practicing biblical repentance and some more Davidic uh, psalms.